traction at all, no rear spin to the front, the rear, the front has enough grip. And here it is, the first thing that greets you, even if you were to take the stock R34 with the standard power onto the circuit, uh, the brakes will fade out very, very soon. So we're now at Midori Seibi Center, somewhere in Yokohama, and we're going to be talking to the founder, Mr. Uchinaga-san, who tuned and built um, Japonics R34 GTR. Hello GT Channel viewers and welcome to today's episode on tuned cars and we have actually Japonics Midori Tune R34 GTR. Of course all of you who know this car very well, a legend in JDM but this looks very normal, looks pretty stock with the Nismo bumper but it's actually got 600 horsepower inside, there's a lot of goodies and we're going to be talking about it so come join us. R34 GTR is a true legend, especially with the 90s GT. Perhaps it sits right at the top of the food chain, maybe next to the NSX. But of course, for those of you who watch Paul Walker's Fast and Furious series, uh, you've probably been introduced to it and play Gran Turismo. And of course, in popular culture, the, the BNR34, which is the chassis code number, uh, the last iteration of the Skyline GTR before it became just a GTR, with R35, of course, that's a really fantastic car. Out of the box, has between 530 horsepower to the full 600 horsepower of the Nismo, and it's still being sold today. But if you are a retro or rather neoclassic JDM fan, especially of the Bayside Blue R34 GTR, this is always going to be iconic. However, on its own, the R34 GTR in reality might not actually be that exciting, contrary to a lot of popular belief. Now, even though the 300 horsepower from the RB26 2.6 litre, rather heavy chassis, um, it isn't as exciting as you would expect, especially when you compare it with modern cars like the R35 and a lot of other modern contemporaries. But back in the day, it was a technological wonder um, taken from the basis of the Group A racing R32, and it was developed three generations with the same technology with the same layout and because of the gentleman's agreement that it only had to have 280 horsepower in reality it's a little bit more somewhere between 300 to 320 would be perhaps a little bit more accurate but it wasn't actually enough now it had the hardware it had the structure the body rigidity and the chassis technology uh, to take a lot more power now even back in the r32 days it was made for Group A racing. The Group A version had something between 500 to 600 horsepower. Now, which means the RB26 inline six cylinder twin turbos was engined right from the start to be able to take a lot more horsepower. So what are the things that actually go into making this sort of engine? You can see from the previous episode when we visited mines and we talked about the engine, how various parts can be built, can be strengthened in order to give it the reliability it needs. Now, let's talk a little bit about tuning engines for a bit. Now, in order to understand what actually goes into engine tuning, we're gonna to have to look at certain characteristics of it. So, underneath here is a genuine 600 horsepower engine. Most of it's based on HKS parts through various generations. So let's go ahead and have a look. I'm gonna pop the bonnet of Japonics R34. And here it is, the first thing that greets you rather huge and thick, genuine titanium strut bar, um, a custom part from Midori Sebi. It's not too different from other Nismo parts or whatever, but the R34, or rather even the whole Skyline series, really needs a thick strut bar in order to give that increased body rigidity. Uh, Nissan bodies are well, perhaps a little bit down in rigidity uh, overall on, this, on the floor strength compared to like other makes, but this way it really, really helps. Let's go to the engine. 
You see it's in the original red um, paint covering of the Valfade cover, just like the stock one. It's got the words Skyline GTR on it, but the other things are a little bit different. Can you spot them? And the first thing they agreed to is this here, V-cam system uh, from HKS, which essentially turns a normal engine with the fixed variable time cam into a variable time system. It's a VVT, very much like the later version 2JZ with the VVT-i and also for the MyVec system. It changes the intake side cam timing, which is very important to give it a better response and low-end torque, but also to release that hidden potential uh, with aggressive cams. Another thing that you'll see that's different from the stock is it's not just an emblem here. The intake premium is a genuine Nismo part, which gives it more even and better airflow uh, for higher power applications. Other than that, it's not too much different. You'll see here the oil catch tank, which is also very important on a RB26. Moving on to this side, the stock air intake funnel is kept as long as the stock air intake box. No mushroom filters here. There's a reason for that. Um, aluminium intake pipe. Other than that, it looks pretty stock. But for the Eagle Eye, you'll be able to notice that the airflow meter is not an R34 component. This is where it's been upgraded with more modern technology. This is an airflow meter taken from the R35. And that's one of the products that Midori Sebi Center uchinaga san actually sells in order for the upgrade of this. So let's talk a little bit about why tuning as a whole hasn't really changed much from the history, but yet it's also modernized in another way. Now, especially in America where tuning means a lot of power, 600 horsepower may not be that much, but it's also where the engine that produces this power, where in the rev range, what is the kind of response that's very, very important. And that's always been a hallmark of Japanese tuning, especially back in the 90s where there was a huge jump in, in advancement of technology, of electronics technology, of further development into engine parts, which was already built from a good base of road cars that the manufacturer produced. Group A derived cars, homologation specials, and also their participation in motorsports enabled them to provide a very good base that could be used for tuning. Now cars these days, because of the development costs, a lot of them are based on sort of economy engines and improvement there. While that is, of course, very, very good, the 90s was where technology really shined. The RB26 itself, named by Nissan for response balance, and gives you a hint of what the engine uh, is supposed to do uh, right from the box. Designed of course, as a base engine for their normal Skylines, the RB26 is a little bit special, created for Group A racing from the R32 days, but built on that and improved with the parts and of course the cooling uh, electronics around that. Now, using that as a good base, numerous tuners in Japan, everything from mine to top secret, and lesser known ones like Midori Savi Center, uh, have taken that concept and put their own spin using available parts such as HKS uh, in order to tune the engine. The part itself is just one half of the story. The person who's able to put the engine together and do the final tuning with the balance of the car. And, it, and you have to also consider the reliability of the cooling. Turbo cars produce a lot of heat and if this is not kept uh, managed very well, you will overheat even the street, even before you into the track. Now the rest of the car, of course, has to be complemented with a very good chassis balance, good suspension. Um, putting it on is just one thing, but understanding the right settings in order to suit uh, that power delivery. And of course, for the driver it's himself, this car was actually a customer car requested uh, by a gentleman who was thinking of upgrading to an R35 according to the story, but then wanted to get more life out of the classic R34. And he decided, well, I'm gonna put this amount of money in. I want this kind of horsepower. Would it be able to match and be more exciting than an R35? So Ujinaga-san of Midori Sebi Center uh, explains in his concept what the car has. So in order to find out about this car and its background, with all the tuning parts, let's go pay a little visit to Ujinaga-san in Midori Sebi Center, somewhere in Yokohama. So let's go. So we're now at Midori Sebi Center, somewhere in Yokohama. We're going to be talking to the founder, Mr. Ujinaga-san, who tuned and built um, Japonics R34 GTR 
and he's going to be explaining to us a little bit about the tuning concept, uh, what parts that went in it, and we're also going to be looking at the new installation of the upgraded HKS EVC, which will hopefully um, cold boost better and just have more stable power. So let's go talk to him. Ujinaga san, thank you. Hi. Thank you for. Hi. Hi, <laughs> thank you for inviting me. Um, Midori Seibi, Rekishi ga nagai desu te, eima mode. Nanen yarimashita desu ka? Eto, 45 nen narimasu ka ne? ああ、はい。えっと、少しあの、この店と、え、緑色のコンセプトの話をするよろしいですか。はい。僕はもともとあの、日産にいたんですね。日産のディーラーにいたんですが、ま、え、日産をやめてから、ま、自分でここで、え
あの性能を出すためにポートのチューニングからそういうところにすごく、はい、あの神経使います。あれこそは秘密っていうのところね。うん、まあ、ねでも今はね、うん、秘密っていうよりも、うん、まあ NC で僕のせあのポート研磨したのが、はい、もう NC でできるようになったので。うん、前は僕が全部これは僕が全部ポートをやったことありますでも手で僕は全部ポート研磨したああすごい,すごいあの心で心ああ全部泣いてるんですよねそうだからレスポンスがよくてだからそういうポートもそういうノウハウがありますなるほど、うん、ありがとうございます、はい、で今日では、えー、と EBC もっとあの新しいもの変えるですね、はい、例えばあの理由がありますかそうですねあの今までの EVC では、うん、オーバーシュートが大きいなるほどうん、だから今度のーオーバーシュートが大きくて、えー、高回転になるとブーストが下がる傾向にある今度の新しいモデルはオーバーシュートが小さくて安定してる,、うんうん、定してるはい、はい、そこのパワーをキープそうですね,そうですね、はい、なるほど、はい、今までなんかフルブーストにしたからなんか下がって感じだったんですよねですはい、であと、ECU の,のあとリセッティングをしますかいや、まあ、ブーストが同じブーストだったら大丈夫です、分かりましたあのブーストが変わらなければ OK、うんまあ、ブースト 1.6 から 1.8 とか変えるんだと、再度、ECU をチェックする必要があるけれども、はいはい、じゃあ楽しみにしてます、はい、ありがとうございました、はいはい、どうも。どうも After the installation of the HKS EBC 7th generation, hopefully we're going to be able to see Uh, fast improvements in drivability that the boost doesn't drop.、Um, it's all about hardware. And, you know, the latest hardware always has an advantage over old hardware, but also it's all about the kind of minor settings that you do in order to match、uh, the equipment and power levels that you're aiming for、uh, in, this, in any particular car. So, you know, the specs of the car could be similar, but when you're starting new parts,、uh, what's most important is the setting. And a setting may not be Applicable to similar tunes of other cars, it has to be done according to each individual car because the life of the spark plugs, for example, are different.、Uh, the, the particular、uh, ECU settings in that particular car、uh, with the turbocharger, even if the parts are similar, it is always better to give a proper tuning、um, on the dyno if possible and also on the road. And so that's what we're going to be looking at. And let's hope that the 600 horsepower will stay consistently and test this really fast Bayside Blue. So, Let's have a look. So, after listening to Uji Naga san explain about using some modern parts in order to refine what is already being done on the tuning, which is actually from 2011, now a little bit of what's inside the engine. It is not a 2.6 liter、um, HKS Zero kit, is a 2.8 liter stroke kit, which includes the crankshaft,、uh, different corn rods in order to give it more stroke, more capacity.、Uh, this was basically the old way of getting more power. From the RB26 with a 2.6 liter, which is not enough against its biggest rival, the 2JZ, which has a 3 liter. So, even though it isn't a full 3 liter, the 2.8 sort of gives it、uh, a balanced characteristic s between the higher revving 2.6 and a little bit more mid range, where it's really lacking on the RB26. However, this also means that it's harder to get the power out. Uh, in a smooth linear flow, which is where the V cam really helps in adjusting the timing in the mid range, and especially when you're just getting on the throttle、um, after mid corners, changing gears,、uh, combined of course with the HKS2025、uh, Kai, Kai, which means、uh, modified or changed, it's a little more modern version. A lot of the parts are from 2011. Uh, which includes this huge ARC big capacity intercooler. Now, let's explain about why intercooler is very important. The RB26 suited intercooler, the stock one on the GTRs, are already about this large. In comparison to the normal turbos, which are about this big, situated on the side, these intercoolers were suited for the original Group A racing, and it's already quite large for a stock car, especially in the 90s. But in order to get More power for more boost, which you can need injectors. The injectors are upgraded with 1050 cc capacity, more ECU tuning, you've got your、uh, bigger capacity, all these things put together.、Uh, the intercooler is the one thing that needs to be very, very efficient. Of course, if your intercooler is also too big, it will create lag. So, a good knowledge of matching of parts is very essential. 
A lot of these parts are available off the shelf, but having that knowledge to select and match each part, sometimes you can't really get more customized parts uh, without actually sizing it. But if you don't know about that, it's really difficult to understand what is the kind of, how can you actually play around with that? Um, the safe way in order to go about that is actually in the ECU tuning. Now, Uchinaga-san believes that using stock ECU as a base and reprogramming the internals, something like what Minds does, instead of using the more popular HKS V Pro, of course, these days you have Lynx, um, of course, the older MoTeC, and all these other issues which are very difficult to tune. Maybe that's where the secret relies in. Midori Tuning is basically a maintenance tuning shop, as the name implies, in Japanese. Seibi Center, which is actually a Nissan, uh, approved dealer, which is where he comes from. But upon learning about the tuning uh, methods and also participating in, in auto shows, uh, all that knowledge has enabled many tuners like him to rise up in the ranks of the tuning world. But their final car, which is offered for customers, and this, this is an example, is not a demo car, as you must understand, is to be driven on the streets. So while you get 600 horsepower, the all important torque figures of about 71 kilograms um, being put through this four wheel drive chassis, is that actually usable on the street? So of course, in order to put that power down, uh, there are various other upgrade clutches that you can use. Uh, this car in particular has the XD two plate carbon one, which gives it a lot of drivability. Uh, it's not very hard and it's selected for ease of driving and be able to handle all that torque and horsepower. In Japan, it's always about balance. Having drivability is something very important to Japanese customers. And this is something that has always been uh, a more realistic look at uh, tuning in, especially the 90s and also the 2000s, well, particularly in Japan, where high horsepower is not really a goal, unlike in some other cultures where uh, it's something to be boasted about. But most Japanese owners aim for enjoying that kind of power uh, for themselves. And so drivability is very, very important. Uh, being able to take your car out even for shopping, um, going to car meets, um, going to the toge and enjoying a light drive, and the occasional circuit is where most of these cars are actually being used. Now, if you look back at old hyper revs at owner's cars, it just looks something like this. It doesn't really look too different from the outside. No wild canards, no huge wings. Uh, looks very stuck on the out on the outside, but on the inside, it's packed with a lot of goodies. It's with well-balanced tuning. So let's go also into the other parts, like the suspension and the brakes, where this actually adds up and sums up the total tuning concept. If you have a lot of power and the car isn't balanced, it can't corner swiftly and confidently and flatly, it's no point. And if you have a lot of acceleration, but you can't stop on the dime or without fading, it's also no point. Now, this is where the brakes are usually always upgraded on any kind of tuning on a Skyline GTR. The stock Brembo brakes, while it has the name, it's got four pots and the disc size looks pretty great uh, for the stock car, it's actually not enough when you increase the power. In fact, even if you were to take the stock R34 with the standard power onto the circuit, uh, the brakes will fade out very, very soon. The capacity of it is actually even smaller than a Lancer Evolution stock one, which is why brakes are always upgraded. Uh, Ujana Gazan has chosen the Alcon Racing six-port calipers, which is something quite rare, not used these days. Back in the days before the R35 came out, which is the nice option for upgrade, um, F50 brakes uh, would usually be used or maybe endless. But Alcons are very special because they come straight from um, Group A racing and also racing cars. Two-piece caliper, 365 diameter disc, more than enough. But the secret is all inside the, the calipers. Uh, it's lighter weight uh, compared to the, the other Brembo models, um, even if the pads are a little expensive, but it stops just like a racing car. Now the suspension on Nitron R3 with a separate outside gas cylinder, which is very close to a racing spec. So the specs of this is really high and settings and the tuning is also very important along with wheel alignment. Now these are minor little things they do help a lot in control when you are actually going, um, even let's say coming out of a ramp and you put a little power down out of the toll gate and you're just coming onto the highway, the car needs to feel as if it was tuned that way from the factory. Now, this is moving a little closer step to modern cars uh, like the Porsche GT3 or the R35. And that's where modern tires can really, really help. 
uh, this car is fitted with the Michelin Pilot Sport 4S, which is one of the greatest road tires, uh, radials that you can, you can use on road cars today without actually going to the circuit. Iconic wheels, the Volk Racing TE27 in 18 inch uh, in bronze. And you cannot get more textbook than this, but it's a look that everyone loves. Japonic loves it. Um, it's very easily recognizable. But if you notice, you know, going down the road and you see R34 Blue, Bayside Blue R34 GDR with those Alcon brakes, the Skyline sticker, which by the way is an option from the original catalog. And also this sticker, which is genuine by the way, huge GTR Skyline. Uh, it's a decal also from the option catalog, very rare these days. It's probably this car. Now, this is a great fan book. I love Skyline GTR. Here is the original catalog. We're just going to take a look at this beautifully finished uh, original catalog, the R34 GTR. This is the V Spec 2. And you can see here in its full glory the stock uh, looks and the original uh, bumper and also the rear wing, the diffuser, and all these little details. Um, this is probably the catalog that made a lot of people want the Bayside Blue. Uh, even back in the 1999 in Japan, a lot of owners that did actually spec for this. And it's great because it explains a lot about the NACA duct for the uh, carbon fiber bonnet, which is one of the first. Here you can see the design of the rear diffuser compared to the one that's on this car's map. And there's a little weight in the center. I'm not really sure why, but that's something very interesting. The front has a diffuser and a V-spec and the V-Spec 2 also. And here you can see how it explains the aerodynamic efficiency of each part, which is a huge jump in technology from the R33. And this is the internals of the RB26 DETT's engine and the individual throttle bodies are shown very beautifully here, uh, which is quite rare for a production car. Original stock exhaust, the six-speed Getrag gearbox, which was a first by Nissan, um, six-speed, not very prominent back then in the uh, 1990s, and the Atessa ETS Pro, which is the huge difference between the V-Spec and the non-V-Spec. The V-Spec has a torque distributing rear diff, something like AYC, but um, it's still a bit in, different in technology. Um, front low arms are aluminium, double wishbone, multi-link suspension, front and rear. You can see here's beautiful catalog. and of other interest is here. This is the GTR V-Spec N1 race car base spec. It doesn't have the air conditioner, which means the air oil cooler is in the place of the air corn condenser, which is something very interesting. This is the rarest spec of all, not the NUR, mm. which is also something that we forgot to mention. Uh, the engine of this Midori car uh, wasn't the original engine of, the, of this uh, car when it was new. It's made using a brand new N1 block um, called the uh, 24U. Uh, it's a stronger block with better internals and better oil flow. Um, always used it by tuners to create a new engine, which uh, is something important to, to create reliability. So you can see here, this is the original option catalog and you see the sticker. Um, it is the same. Here you can see uh, it's the same stickers on the fender and also the rear. Looking exactly like the optional catalog. So proof that this is a genuine item, not just a fanboy item. If you so wish, even back in the day, you could get the shroud around the intercooler um, box, which doesn't, doesn't have a grill. Very interesting, optional, optional parts catalog. Beautiful. Now the bumper is from a genuine Nismo uh, factory option. And one of the biggest differences between the stock GTR bumper is this little vent right here. Uh, it's for exhausting air coming out from the front, which uh, goes through the oil cooler, cools it and removes the hot air, which is actually more important to remove hot air than actually having air entering it. The oil cooler, of course, has been upgraded along with the radiator and other cooling parts, which needs to be of a bigger capacity in order to support that 600 horsepower. More horsepower means more heat and you're going to have to remove it somehow um, compared to the stock even if, you're, even if the cars were running on the highway, there is a difference of about 20 uh, degrees Celsius uh, in running just on boost, on throttle uh, constantly. And you can imagine going to the circuit without upgrading your 
your cooling and, and it's just, well, you're going to explode. Not really explode, but it's going to run high temperatures and it could affect the long-term reliability of the car. It could even damage the engine. Now, the concept, of course, of a lot of Japanese tuners is to be able to enjoy high power, but also to have that same reliability as a stock car. Now, some R35 GTR owners have actually complained about the cooling uh, not being quite adequate even from the factory. Now, you would imagine, it, you know, the engine creates more than 550 horsepower. It should be able to run on the circuit um, without problems. Uh, Japonics also own two R35 GTRs and really they had to be replaced on one. And you can also see in our video with, on, from JDM Masters, Indra, he also has an R35 GTR and he has explained that he has to replace the radiator once. It's not really adequate. And so this is where tuning parts really comes in um, to fill up that gap and thinking about putting more power, you cannot do it without upgrading the cooling system. Whether it's an NA car, but especially on turbo cars, it's extremely important. Now, Japonic has chosen to go for the front bumper using the Nismo Aero Kit. As you can see also from the front, there's a lot of different size vents in order to feed more air into the intercooler and the radiator. The number plate uh, has been moved to the side in order to give more surface area to the intercooler. A small modification like this is very important. It can make a big difference. Um, other parts of the Nismo bumper um, carries the original V-Spec uh, spoiler for aerodynamics while being very subtle. It's maybe, you know, efficient and enough. The grill on top is of a different shape uh, more aerodynamic efficiency, very, very small, but it's different from the original curve of the stock R34. Side here also has another vent, although there is nothing here, it's just to match it on the side. Uh, the aero on the side skirt is also the Nismo kit, which is not too aggressive, but this little trench here um, allows air to be fed away and to increase downforce, of course. Um, downforce is something which was an original design goal of the R34 GTR. Uh, the rear diffuser only on the V-Spec was something that really made a big difference in high-speed stability. Here on the rear, we also have the standard, well, standard Nismo uh, kit, which has the bumper uh, air diffusers. I'm going to this now. And here he's fitted the rear diffuser, which is in the same style as the Nismo or the stock R34 V-Spec one, but it's a sort of um, aftermarket one which is made in Australia. What's different is it doesn't have that heavy weight center in the bottom. It's in the same style, therefore giving the same uh, aerodynamic efficiencies. Uh, R34 GTR uh, really does make a difference when it has this um, versus when it doesn't have. Even though it adds a little bit of weight, but that downforce is well very well worth it. So you know, looking really innocent, looking really stock. Um, the only other telltale sign is the big risers, uh, R34 style wing with increased height on the stock wing in order to give it even just a little bit more downforce. Here of course the stock part uh, enables the attack angle to be adjusted. So it kind of feels like this could have been an upgraded spec that you have gotten from the factory. Um, not only Midori Savi Center, uh, but tuners like Mines, um, and there's quite a lot of other good tuners out there, um, have this sort of similar concept where a 90s car sort of feels incomplete. And so all these upgrades going into that, uh, making it balance, making the drivability um, improve quite a lot, sort of makes that perfect desirable spec that people actually wanted. And that is particularly why uh, the owner, uh, the original owner, maybe, uh, wanted in this car. Uh, when Japonic bought it, he's improved it with small different things uh, just according to his taste. But let's interview him a little bit and get his opinions and, on his and driving experience. So we'll go for a little drive after this and I'll tell you how I feel about it. Let's go. We're going to take a little test drive with the uh, Midori Tune 600 horsepower R34 GTR. And what's wonderful about tuning uh, with old cars is that parts are always still being improved. Now, even though the HKS parts used on this car is back from 2011, the new parts these days are 
been still further refined. Imagine if you had the new pistons and you know just more balancing. But it's not really needed because the tuning peak uh, was probably about 10 years ago. I agree. Everything after that is just the fine tuning of the ECU settings, which makes a lot of difference with turbo cars, especially. Now, compared to the stock GTR, which you had one before. How did yes, you feel? I had one before. So, stock GTR is actually, honestly, pretty slow after you drive this. Normally, maybe it's not that slow, but it I came. Feels slow, it feels slow, right? It feels it slow. It feels slow. I came from yeah. a stock GTR to stock R34 to this, so I can really understand the difference. At the same time, I had 35 GTR, mm. which was around 575 horsepower. I always felt that this is more responsive and quicker. Probably at higher speeds, R35 is very stable. Right. And maybe top speed is a bit higher. I never tried the top speed on this, but fifth gear, uh, 7,000 RPM, it did 270. I think it can do 320 easily if there's available road, like Autobahn in Germany. Right. makes up for that response especially when you're at lower speeds now putting more uh, power uh, is one thing but it's the torque that really helps to move uh, this lighter car exactly. forward um, you can see in a, a little drag race with Indra <laughs> you easily best him, right? Now we're talking about street here where you don't need to use the full power of the car. And yoo-hoo! Okay. There we go. I mean, immediately you can feel how... Uh, <laughs> oh, man, it's a bit difficult to describe really. Like on the street, the power doesn't really punch you straight in the back of the head. In fact, I don't really feel that kick that much, if that makes sense. 2.8 liters has a slightly longer stroke than the original 2.6, which does give it a, a different sound. Uh, this mine's demo car, Nakayama-san and uh, Nikora-san wanted to keep that 2.6 to get that high pitch sound, but I feel that this is a bit more deep. But at the same time, when you put that foot down, uh, it revs up very quickly, even for a 2.8 liter. Yeah, but I think still mine is revving way faster. Way faster, yes, way I, faster. So we have seen the videos of yeah. mine's legendary R34, it's way faster. This has got something to do with the stroke, but for this kind of tune, for the parts that are available off the shelf, so to speak, off the shelf, yeah, once exactly. it's well put together, you got the uh, EVC7, which I could clearly feel that it holds the boost much better. It's can handle quite a lot of power and putting it to the front downhill no. there's no distraction at all no rear spin to the front to the rear the front has enough grip uh, going to these Michelin 4S's it really feels very pliable brakes on the Alcon brake <laughs> oh we just went through a big bump right there the car just settled back very very quickly planted Imagine this is actually going to the nerve which be a lot of fun. You can see now 
graph on the RPI meter how long the gear ratios on the stock six speed are actually. Um, in daily driving, you'll be using mostly one, two, three, keeping it below 3000 RPM. The stock R34 has this weakness of lacking a lot of response and torque. Actually, feels less drivable than in any Honda. But on this, uh, response always feels much better. Driving daily is really not a problem. I think, yeah, so the problem with fuel economy for your case was exactly. probably due to up here, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's shifting at higher RPMs all the time. It's yeah, because cool. you want to hear that turbo noise. Because and it's so uh, addictive. Yeah. It? It's a circuit. You just love this. That's why you bought this car. Yeah, it's not garage queen, you know? So. You're actually it's driving it how it's how it's meant to be driven. Yeah. Now that the value of these R34 GTRs are so high, yes, you shouldn't be driving it and trashing it. But you I'm, not, I'm not. I'm not trashing it. Trashing it's it. just I'm enjoying the car. I'm not trashing the car. To the next traffic light, giving a little bit of acceleration. I usually change before 4,000 RPM and gets back into below 3,000, and it's easy. It's easy. It feels like it has so much more usable low end torque yes. than than stock engine. If you accelerate you go. <laughs> Come on. Well this is more normal driving and then for example you know you're at 60 now, something like that, and then you just want to oh, overtake, okay. give it a quick throttle the accelerator. More than enough. Check the speedometer how it just goes high. <laughs> it just changes up so fast. <laughs> I don't have a pedal. You don't have a pedal. <laughs> when I see this open road, I have to bam, bam. Uh, That's why my fuel economy is like It's always bad. <laughs> you, you, you like that self-control, bro. <laughs> now, even in normal driving, the brakes uh, doesn't feel jumpy. Very common with racing brakes. Yeah. You get on it a little bit, it just Bites, right? bites too hard. Oh, it's like this is still sudden, aggressive. sudden head moves. Like yeah, this sudden head moves. This still very, very progressive. Um, so I would say that this car is still very, very much drivable, which is exactly in line with the tuning concept of some of these old Japanese tuners. Exactly. You increase the problem, increase the power, but it's still livable. Maybe it's just on the edge, you know? If you go a bit further here, yeah. it won't be like exactly, drive exactly. daily drivable like this. Oh, I like it compared to a stock car or even a lightly tuned car with just only boost up the complete menu of this. Maybe here. Ah, that beep beep warning sound for the key is something very, very JDM. Um, in fact, back in the days uh, when we had cars that were similar spec in Europe, uh, if your car had this beep beep sound, and of course, these Japanese words on the, uh, the sun shield, it was a genuine JDM car. That's something that I um, always, always like. So let's talk a little bit about the upgrades on the interior of his R34 GTR. Now, other than some subtle Nismo upgrade parts, it really looks like your standard R34 GTR interior. Nismo white face clusters uh, ending in 11,000 RPM. Maybe it's never going to reach there. But the red line of this car with this particular tuning is 8,700 RPM, which is very high for a turbocharged car. Um, the inline six doesn't really reach that, but it's quite amazing that the RB26 is able to reach this kind of high RPM level, kind of like a Honda. R34 VTEC. R34 VTEC. <laughs> the R34, when it first came out, uh, was praised for this high technology of the center console. Um, just electronic display case. You can see early on, it had the word Nismo, and it's been upgraded with more choices on viewing uh, your gauges. And here is the uh, G meter, which only comes on the Nismo option. Of course, you have the split screen, and you can see the gauge graph, and of course, twin gauges. And you press here, you can even have the um, shift up pattern, uh, lap time, which is very interesting, uh, only available on the Nismo. But this was highly praised for its uh, ingenuity, which of course, now when you look at it, it's like PlayStation 1 technology. Um, underneath here is a Midori Sebi Center original part. It's a G sensor, which enables the Atessa four-wheel drive system to send more torque to the front, uh, which matches the characteristics of the increased power and torque, um, putting all that 
power to the rear wheels uh, would make the car a little bit unstable. So putting more torque to the front and able to get the car to steer more like a four wheel drive uh, was also some of the items that were considered and developed um, when making such a high power. Now other things that he did might be a little bit questionable, but the end result is actually really nice. This is a genuine stock seat cover made by Nismo, original item. Uh, you can see a little clip here where we went to get it the last time. Um, it protects the value and the condition of the original R34 seats, which are very expensive uh, these days. These cars are becoming fast, becoming high price collectors, just like paintings and sculptures. So, you know, uh, a discerning owner would want to protect the stock seats as much as possible from, you know, uh, cheering of the fabric. And it's impressive because this really looks like it is just straight from the factory. You know, it's not like a cover, especially in the center part here. It has these uh, punch holes with the red inside and a very nice semi-suede uh, material. It really gives that little high-grade feel. Uh, other than that, the steering wheel looks stock uh, with, the, with, the, with the center airbag thing, but the exterior of this is from a G GTR magazine special. Um, the leather on this part, as you can see, uh, punch hole and that European-style cross uh, red stitching rather than the single ones in the Japanese uh, original cars uh, gives it a more modern and more European feel which is you know really really welcome other things like this was the EVC7 uh, boost controller and modern screens uh, kind of like a phone here's just a stock R34 uh, shift knob with the center made of aluminum this is a very expensive item by the way about 20,000 yen so yeah, don't, don't, don't ruin these. Owners chose to keep the interior uh, very clean and period correct. No big gauges uh, to keep that sort of stock driving experience. And this is how the car should be enjoyed, I believe. We've talked about what a balanced tuning car is and the R34 from Midori owned by Japonic is a very good example of a daily use, high powered, high performance sports car that has the true essence of classic JDM, but also with some modern parts. And perhaps this is a good example of the way that tuning can be done, especially for these classics now that they're very expensive and they're getting a lot rarer. Can this be a good base for the concept of owners or you know, especially now for people who want to buy these old cars and let us know also in the comments uh, what you think about it but in our opinion here at GD channel uh, it's always about sportiness with good performance and also how you can enjoy it on a daily basis uh, drive it like it's meant to be driven it's not really a garage queen but you know still also about keeping that image that everyone knows and you love uh, the Nismo bumper, uh, the, the rear diffuser and all these little body parts uh, keep it very refined and very classy as well. So let us know in the comments what other 90s cars you like us to review and check out and if you are able to find them. And until next time, hope you enjoyed this episode. Peace out.